The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. I'm Patrick, Head of Technology at professional services firm Collins SBA. I'm a former financial advisor who just loves solving business problems and creating better client experiences using technology. Join me each week as we unpack the tech on offer to advise professionals, stay on top of tech trends and help you break free from the analysis paralysis experience when building and maintaining a great tech stack. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where your clients have the best wealth technology at their fingers. With NetWealth's next-gen client portal and mobile app, clients can view and manage their portfolio, assets, and accounts wherever they are. By adding external bank and property feeds to their NetWealth account, they can get a true picture of their wealth. And by giving them the ability to transact and manage their cash, they can feel in control of their wealth. A world of client engagement awaits. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Today on the podcast, we're talking transcription and AI note-taking with Daniel Yu. So Daniel's based in the US and is the founder of FinMate AI, a note-taking assistant specifically designed for financial planning practices that helps ease the burden of the bane of most advisors' existence or any power planner or any supporting team member that has to read, make sense of, and rely on file notes. So Daniel's a former financial advisor with a Master's of Science in Applied Economics that focused on using machine learning and AI for asset price predictions, as well as someone with experience working in fintech prior to starting FinMate AI. Well, I mean, what I've found from being an avid listener of this show pre-Patrick is that the best tools are built by those that have had a lived experience or sat in the chair before. But Daniel's gone and done it all. And I didn't even mention the other Bachelor of Economics or the Bachelor of Molecular Cell Biology Development Genetics. Wow. I started by asking Daniel what the oldest piece of tech he still owns is and whether he still uses it. Yeah. Uh, so it, I guess, you know, as we were speaking before, it uh, depends on what you would consider technology still. Uh, but as funny it, it, as it might be to say for someone who runs an AI note-taking company, uh, pens are great. I love right. pen and pad. It helps, I think, get your initial thoughts organized before they need to get actually organized. I'm still very much a tactile person, okay. so I enjoy uh, that. It makes sense. I think... Like it actually means that if you're using, I'm probably jumping the gun here in terms of what the tool actually is, but it means that your handwritten notes become a lot more meaningful because they're not the only notes that you've taken. I'm not sure if that resonates with you. It's that, but it's also, uh, I, you know, my short term memory has a certain capacity, right. uh, my working memory, right? And so I just need like a reference point that I put down. It might, I might not need it for long term, but just. During that conversation, it's just a point of reference I want to drop down. Makes total sense. No, I um, yeah, I still am unsure whether that counts as technology, but um, maybe I'll have to change the question. Who knows? So, moving to yeah, definitely a technology question. And your business obviously has AI in its name. But what would you say are uh, one or two cool ways that you're using AI, maybe personally? Yeah. So. The way I got started in the AI field was during my master's program at uh, Johns Hopkins for Applied Economics. Mm -hmm. And over there, we were trying to see if we can do asset price predictions using AI. Uh, wow. So taking, uh, feeding in you know, past uh, prices for different stocks, uh, running it through some AI, seeing if it could accurately predict um, you know, stock prices in the future. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think it works that well. <laughs> and so that's probably why I switched over to using uh, large language models instead of a uh, uh, number prediction AI. Okay. The stakes are still high, but not as high. Yes. And it works better. Nice. So, I mean, just on that, we're both ex-advisors. Um, I'm glad one of us has actually done something in their retirement. 
But can you take us through your like your financial planning origin story, what FinMate AI actually is and what led you to build it? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, for the majority of my career, I was a financial advisor. Uh, I'd like to say I still am. Uh, at least in the United States, we have uh, our regulatory board, uh, FINRA, yep. where our licenses are from. And my licenses are still active. Uh, my uh, master's program thesis advisor actually worked for FINRA. And so he let me know early that they were coming out with their five-year dormancy program where I right. could store my licenses without being an active advisor. Nice. And if I ever wanted to start a preferred, uh in advising, I wouldn't need to take the uh, licenses again. Um, right. In terms of how I got started, uh, financial advising was my first job out of college. And I just stuck with it until I switched over to tech about, uh, I want to say about three years ago, two and a half years ago. And uh, at least in the States, all FINRA licenses are public. So you can look up my record uh, yeah. on on broker check if you'd like. So I started my career at uh, Prudential, got my 663 licenses, uh, decided I wanted to pursue kind of the fuller licensing. So I switched over to uh, Equitable, uh, which was known as AXA back then. Um, and got my 765 from AXA Equitable and um, stayed there for three, four years uh, learning learning the trade. Uh, started off, obviously, as most younger advisors do uh, with smaller clients. So I was serving a lot of uh, local teachers uh, as well as you know pastors and uh, folks like that. And then <clears throat> moved towards uh, tech workers. And then eventually I decided I uh, wanted to try a different model of business. And so went into uh, TD Ameritrade, okay. where I became an advisor, uh, got promoted. Uh, and then by the end of it, I believe my practice and non-practice book combined was about $800 million. Then TD merged with Schwab. Uh, and I stayed about a year after the merge, I believe, until I decided it was time to move on. I've always liked technology. I've always felt that the financial advisory space was a little bit slower than the rest of uh, the industry. So especially having, you know, gone to college in UC Berkeley and having lived in the Bay Area and the Silicon Valley, I think that difference was made a little bit more starkly clear. So after T.D. Schwab uh, joined a startup as the uh, leading operations, uh, building up their ops team, uh, learned a lot about the startup world and then eventually transitioned to starting Inmate. So in a lot of ways, this is just a circling back to my origins, uh, back to my old industry. Uh, uh, bringing back the things I learned from tech. And so uh, one of the most annoying things that, that I had to do as an advisor is, of course, note-taking and documentation. My old manager can testify I was pretty bad at it. Right. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I wanted to solve that issue. Uh, and I wanted to be present you know, when I'm meeting with clients and be like there uh, and have all my attention there. I realized during my stint in the startup space uh, in uh, consumer level fintech, there were generic AI note takers at the time. Yeah. And I realized this is probably not sufficient, either, neither in terms of the uh, organizational layout of the notes, right. nor in the data security privacy uh, that financial conversations would require. So uh, FinMate was started to fix all of those issues, um, bring um, advanced technology to the advisor space. Uh, but do it in a way where it's actually useful for advisors. And so our firm is very much advisor-led. Uh, we like to probably say we're the only AI note-taker built by an advisor. Yep. Uh, and so it's not a tech company uh, trying to push their way in. Wow. Okay. There's obviously a lot to unpack there. So I think you're probably what's called a, a unicorn, Daniel, where you've got the – the tech experience and the financial planning experience, and then you've gone out and built um, technology specifically for either financial advisors or a fan financial planning practice or firm. I mean, you mentioned the there are those sort of generic tools out there and you mentioned security as well. What would you say is the main challenge or challenges with the security of those other AI transcription products? And then maybe I'll ask you to take us through at a high level the data policy for FinMate AI. Sure. Uh, great question. I think for generic note takers, a lot of them are operating in business environments where privacy is less of a concern. Right. Uh, and a lot of these AI companies, uh, so in terms of AI, data is power, right? Yeah. And so the more that more data that these companies can gather together and keep and train their AI, 
the stronger and the more valuable yep, AI as a resource. Yep. Right, as a resource. Uh, and so you'll see things like Zoom's AI, um, their security or data retention policy. Basically, they claim uh, at least uh, there is an article from ZDNet.org that reported that their policy included that Zoom has rights over your data to do with as they wish. Um, okay. And so uh, late 2023, I believe they were mm-hmm. going through a lawsuit uh, based on kind of improper data handling. Um, so uh, for Finmate itself, we have no um, desire to become a huge AI company in general. Right. And so what we do is we have a by default data deletion policy. And so uh, all recorded calls, uh, video calls, things like that, audio are deleted after one month. Uh, and all of the generated transcription, notes, um, follow-up email, sentiment analysis, all of the AI-generated things are also deleted after six months. Uh, we do not claim any right over your data and uh, between you and your clients, and we don't train any AI off of that data. Uh, I do a lot of role-playing is how we yeah. refine our note-taking modules based okay. off of uh, my experiences as an advisor. Uh-huh. So that's really interesting with the uh, comments around, for example, Zoom. I assume you're alluding to the fact that they may have, may not anymore or at this point in time be using data to enhance their product in the future. But what you're saying is we've got this problem where the data is maybe technically theirs, but also maybe if you offboard that platform, do you then get that data when you offboard? It's not clear, okay. to be honest. Uh, perhaps in European nations, it might be sure. a little bit easier with their GDPR policies. Yep. Uh, but at least in the States, we don't have um, that kind of robust protection for uh, user data. Okay. No, that's that's really great. I, I think there's, there's obviously this catch-22 now where we're like, you know, What's your, um, you know, obviously we want you to be focused on security and make sure everything's compliant and safe and don't sell my data and don't use my data. And then on the flip side, it's like, oh, okay, well, we're going to delete it. So how do you sort of respond to maybe um, practices in not just the US but other countries where they might have different data retention policies? Is there an easy way to export that data or extract that data? What do you sort of suggest there? Great question. Uh, so I know in different countries there's um – requirements of data retention for compliance purposes and for auditing purposes. For our perspective is, at least when I was an advisor, we had tools that were already there for that kind of long-term storage. And so our philosophy is use us as a lightweight tool. Right. Take what we can generate and store it in your CRM, inside your cloud storage, because those are technologies that uh, firms, existing firms have already used and vetted for years. Uh, we should not be your CRM. Right. We should not be your cloud storage. Perfect. Makes total sense. And I guess I've, I've as I do, I, I jump around and and um, go down rabbit holes. So we've probably skipped over what actually makes FinMate AI different or, or a financial planning specific tool. Can you sort of take us through how you've sort of managed to build something that is specific for financial planning practices or advisors? Sure. Uh, so if you've been in financial planning and financial advisory services for a while, I'm sure you're familiar with the different kinds of meetings that you run. Right? Yep. And so a generic uh, note taker cannot service those specific note requirements. Uh, at your notes for an intro prospect meeting are going to look very different from a discovery meeting, will look very different from a re- review meeting, will look very different from a tax planning meeting, will look very different from a charitable giving meeting. You know, um, So- what we've done is we've created a modular system where uh, we have different modules that are catered towards the different meeting types. Right. And okay. we are building towards more custom modules. But uh, from my experience as an advisor, advisors don't necessarily like tinkering with technology all that much. So we wanted to build an out-of-the-box solution where it caters to those specific needs. Um, and the email that we generate is uh, crafted so that it's uh, very client-friendly um, and it's meant to replace uh, you having to type out that follow-up email. We also provide a number of analytics tools on our platform to help the advisor do call reviews, either for themselves or for their junior advisors. So one of the more humorous uh, aspects of the analytics uh, tab is the talk time and monologue timer. And so we keep track of what percentage uh, each participant is speaking. 
right. as well as what the longest monologue was. And it's hyperlinked to the transcript. So okay. you can go back and see uh, who said what, when, and how much you're talking. That's, um, yeah, I think that would be incredibly interesting to say, go to maybe a discovery meeting where it's all about the client and see who's actually been doing all the talking. And then oh, maybe you can l- and link that to whether the client signed on or not. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's such a small detail, but it's so, that's so important. There, there's a fun anecdote where uh, we had an advisor and a paraplaner uh, to talk to us and uh, the paraplaner swore that the advisor talked too much and the right. advisor swore, I do not. Right. And uh, they ran a meeting through our system and uh, I believe it was like 80% the advisor was talking oh, and gosh. paraplaner was, you know, telling the advisor, see, I told you. Like, yeah. it's undeniable now. Yeah. And he's like, yep, yeah, you're right. You're right. I, I do stats. talk too much. Oh my goodness. That's, that's awesome. So- I mean, is that, is that how we're talking about different meetings and different contexts, et cetera, but is that how the the AI is displaying, say, a summary or an overview of the transcript? How is it laying it out differently? How is it sort of looking on the, Absolutely. Um, on the front end? Yeah. Absolutely. So for intro prospecting, what you're looking for will be different than a discovery meeting. Yeah. So the discovery meeting note output is very much focused on the details of the accounts. Right. So it breaks it out between, you know, liquid assets, illiquid assets, okay. you know, insurances, liabilities you know, uh, real estate, things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, also talking, uh, it will cover uh, investment styles, retirement goals, uh, plans, really designed to help you build out that financial plan. Right. Whereas the intro prospect meeting is more uh, general details, uh, overview of their finances, uh, you know, motivations and concerns, you know, okay. focus on why they're meeting with the client or why they're meeting with an advisor, things like that. And so, yes, the output looks very different. Um, and we also have a sentiment analysis analyzer okay. on the analytics tab yep. where we take a look at the diction of what was said mm-hmm. and provide a hyperlinked graph of the entire conversation. So if you see a negative emotional spike on the client's timeline, all right, so that was a moment of negative emotional valence. You can click on it. It'll take you to that part of the transcript and then you can read. So in our sample meeting, the client was talking about their education planning. And they said, oh, well, we do have a 529, but with the rising education cost, we're not sure if that's enough. And on the sentiment analysis chart, it shows up as a red bar uh, mm-hmm. at that location. So you can click on it, take you to the part of the transcript, read what the client said and say, okay, this is clearly a an area of um, emotional balance where the advisor in their follow-up meeting should definitely take note of. Uh-huh. So, I mean, another example of that would be, say you might be part of a – a dealer group or you might just want to improve each other when it comes to coaching and, and feedback and maybe someone stepping outside of the the zone and, and listening to the the transcript or those points objectively. He's saying you can quickly hone in on those negative parts in the meeting and you know how you maybe should have responded to that better or something like that. Exactly. So if you are a manager at a larger group yep. and you have, you know, ten advisors under you. Uh, I'm sure you don't have time to listen through the entire call of all of your agents. Uh, And so you can just click through, see what the highlights, emotional highlights of the meeting are, see how the advisor responded, and it can lead to coaching sessions that are much more targeted. Okay. I'm, yeah, definitely starting to see why or how this is beneficial compared to, say, non industry specific transcription software. I mean, if you if you think about like a one of those tools, it could almost be akin to like getting someone off the street to take notes or minutes in a meeting and they don't right. have any context. They don't know what they should be listening out for or what's important or what the actual point of the meeting is. So in theory, you end up with yeah, inconsistencies and then the AI is maybe making assumptions on what's important and what the action items are. Would that be fair? So we, depending on the module, we okay. lay out parameters for what is important right. uh, and we tell it to look for specific key things. Okay. Uh, we are working on, um, so obviously we're a US-based company, yeah. uh, but we do have clients in you know South Africa and Canada, places like that. And so we are developing specific modules for those contexts. So for the American audience, you know, they will understand what a 529 is. Uh, for a Canadian audience, uh, that's not a thing there. Right. And so they, they have certain uh, instruments and platforms that Americans don't have. And so uh, okay. it's just telling the AI, like, hey, like these are the important pieces that, to pay attention to. Right. No, that makes it makes a lot of sense. I think as well, like in Australia, 
it's very common for advisors or advice teams to work in, say, like a pod-based system. Yeah. So the advisor might have like a dedicated para planner or associate advisor, maybe a dedicated client services team member, et cetera. But then the advisor also has like a either an indirect or direct mentoring role of that up and coming advisor, so para planner, associate, et cetera, because that's really the traditional progression for that team member to graduate into an advisor. I guess the issue that we've found in our business with that model is while that um, team member is being mentored, they're only exposed to maybe one way of doing things or one way of advising clients. So, for example, they're in a pod with, with an advisor. They might already have great relationships with their clients. They don't need to go through that you know, rapport building and trust process so much or building process so much. So, yeah, or might only be exposed to certain strategies or clients of particular life stages. But yeah, my question is, do you feel like tools like FinMate AI are also beneficial for those that aren't in the conversation? So maybe up and coming advisors from other pods so they can actually listen in and learn as well, not just those sort of advisor coaching roles or the traditional sort of, um, if you think about those sort of sales businesses where it's like, we're going to listen to your call and coach the heck out of you. What do you sort of think about that? Yeah. So great question. Uh, when I was at TD, they had a call repository that we had access to okay. where they would take uh, the calls and meetings from the top producing advisors and you can listen through um, with, and they'll have notes around it saying, here's why this was, you know, quite well, okay. I can very much imagine uh, something like this also applying for those where you can take a really good call and take note of why it went well. Uh, you know, do the sentiment analysis, go through uh, all the analytics around it and show folks, all right, this is kind of our structure on how we do, yeah, calls here. Makes sense. And I guess as well, like if that if that is the process in the business, like if every meeting is recorded and every person is truly present in every conversation that can only maximize the potential for positive outcomes, right? Right. Well, we would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> With less so distractions. Can try. Uh, I can only try. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any tips for, I guess, advisors or advice professionals that maybe haven't implemented a tool like this before in their business on like where to start? Like what's the best way to tackle this? Hmm. Uh, in terms of AI undertaking? Uh, yeah, exactly. So introducing that into the business. So I think sometimes there's there's maybe this anxiety or hesitation to introduce that to clients or even for advisors themselves thinking that they're now on stage and need to perform and be extra careful. Like what, what sort of onboarding tips would you give, if any? Yeah, great question. Um, at least in the States, uh, what we found was that clients were not hesitant at all. Okay. Um, AI note takers in the States have proliferated quite a bit right. uh, where doctors are using uh, AI note takers in practice. So when they're consulting with their patients, they'll you know, bring out an AI note taker for that as well. Uh, so in the States, there has been pretty low resistance to you on the clients. And for advisors, uh, I understand that feeling of having to maybe perform. Uh, what I would suggest is a couple things. So on our platform, we do have an area where you can upload calls. So okay. if you have a pre-recorded call uh, of a meeting, you can run it just to see how it feels. The alternate thing I would say is if you have multiple advisors in a firm, you can always role play, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Join a call together, or we have uh, options available for in person meetings. Just take lunch, you know, roll through a discovery call or discovery meeting with one of your advisor friends and see how it feels. Uh, and then once you're ready and comfortable with it, then uh, bring it out to your uh, clients. Nice. No, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And then any, any tips for, once once everyone's ready to sort of roll that out to clients, ready to press record, but maybe the client or the prospective client is like, no, nah, no thanks, I don't consent. Any tips on sort of pushback from clients if it does eventuate? Oh, pushback. Um, in, in the States, uh, each of the States have a different regulation around okay. uh, call recordings. And so uh, we have some States that are uh, considered two-party consent States, which means both participants in the call need to actively consent to being recorded. Right. Uh, but for some states, it's a one-party consent state, so only one person needs to acknowledge it, i.e. the advisor. Um, and so in those states, that are, it's, it's less of an issue. In two-party consent states, um, it's usually how the advisor brings it up okay. to the client first. And so instead of saying like, hey, we're recording this, uh, you know, explain why, right? 
like, hey, you know, our firm is trying out a new AI note taker. Uh, it'll help me stay more present with you during this meeting. Would you be okay if we let the AI note taker record a call so we can uh, generate notes from it? Yeah. And if you explain, you know, the client centric reason of why you're using it, I think clients would be a lot less uh, inclined to say no. I would say if they've already said no, it's a little bit harder to then have yeah. them backtrack. <laughs> of course. Yeah. It makes sense. I think one of the ways, I mean, in the early days, I've been retired for a little bit now from the financial planning side. But one of the, the go to strategies I had was I would start the meeting and then start note taking furiously and not actually be looking at the client as much as I should be and then make a just a conscious effort to go like whew, like you know I want to be present for this meeting and I want to be able to look you in the eye and be like basically actively listen and not be writing down notes the whole time so would you mind if I record this meeting and yeah I, I didn't get any pushback but you also like forget as well. Like you just put the phone maybe in the middle of the room if it's a face to face meeting. Also, if you've got a virtual meeting, it's that sort of lifeless tile on the screen, the note taking app or whatever. But I think I think once that initial thirty seconds to one minute is done, you sort of forget that that's live and your phone is not showing that it's being recorded. Like, and there's not a microphone in the middle of the room. Like it it sort of fades away into oblivion pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And at least in the States, uh, in our TD office, our conference room did have mics on the table. Okay. So it was never really an issue, I think, nice. for folks. So it was yeah. already a prop that was there as they walked in. So nothing sort of changed in their environment. Correct. Yeah. Nice. And then, I mean, from a client engagement perspective, obviously we're now sending out these um, highly detailed, or you mentioned sort of, was it the email recap that you're sort of supporting advisors to send out? Yes. Do you have any um, advisors or users that just send out the full transcript or do they share maybe a link to the full um, yeah. maybe portal? How does that sort of look or work? Yeah. So when we designed it, uh, I had originally envisioned this platform to be advisor focused. So right. ideally clients would never hear or see the name FinMate. Right. Um, so, so more of this a backstage was tool. supposed to be a, yeah, a lightweight tool for advisors uh, and obviously for long-term storage purposes, for compliance, you know, we thought it would be bad if the AI driven note taking had automatically archived. And so, you know, we, we did want to leave space for the advisor to make fixes and changes they'd like. Uh, we've had some folks send out the generated notes. Uh, very rarely would uh, advisors send out the entire transcript. Uh, sure. Number one, it's a little bit overwhelming, even for the advisors to go through. So uh, I think it's just the craft that you're sending clients. Um, we are working on some interesting integrations down the road uh, on additional resources uh, that the advisor can send to the clients based on the meeting that they've had. So uh, there'll be definitely uh, additional client-centric pieces uh, coming down the pipe. Okay. And obviously a US-based tool, so not so relevant for the limited array, say limited array, that's an oxymoron, of financial planning tools in uh, the Australian ecosystem. But I assume you integrate with with tools in the US and, and maybe there's more to come as well, as you sort of alluded to there? Oh, absolutely. Currently, uh, we're in a group with Redtail. Wolfbox is about to launch. Uh, these are CRMs. And, uh, so there's a slew of CRM integrations coming. There are some behavioral finance things that we're working on. So okay. I'll be presenting at the uh, Shift conference in March, uh, which is kind of the big behavioral uh, finance conference uh, hosted by Ross Moreno and uh, you know uh, Advisor 2X. Um, and then uh, some additional planning uh, tools that we're planning on integrating with uh, to help just reduce the yeah. non-productive hours that advisors have to spend. Makes sense. You yeah. mentioned the um, behavioral psychology stuff there. Are you able to expand on that a little bit and tell us what's going on there? Yeah. So I think uh, at least in the States, the trend has been towards level three thinking, uh, right. which is basically going beyond just the financial plan. Uh, going into, you know, how does the client think about money? What does money mean for them? You know, yep. how does their uh, backgrounds, childhoods, uh, mentors, yep. how do they shape their view on and philosophy on money? And so there are some firms that um, hire psychologists, therapists, counselors uh, to work with their clients to kind of work through, especially if you're in a couple setting and they have different views on what money is. Um, oftentimes the advisor kind of is stuck between uh, two decision makers. And so 
you need some behavioral understanding uh, for the couple to work through it as well for the advice that the advisor might have to be implemented in, in the client's lives. So uh, the behavioral finance piece is working with uh, experts in the behavioral finance space not to see what frameworks there are, see what things can be automated, see what general guidelines can be presented, um, and maybe uh, modules for those behavioral meetings uh, that are not, you know, a discovery meeting, right? And so those, the outputs for that would be, look very different. Uh, so what you're alluding to there is maybe, or as you said, more modules that maybe aren't so financially focused and maybe more qualitative um, action items or takeouts than quantitative, as you sort of mentioned before, around um, fact-finding and updates to balances, et cetera. Right. So we're tackling it both from the module perspective as well as the analytics perspective. Nice. And so if we can try to generate some insights into the psychology of money uh, for every meeting, and have modules for specifically behavioral finance topics. Nice. No, that's really cool. And I mean, you sort of mentioned there that that is on the development path. Are there, is there anything else that users are sort of asking for or any, any other areas of development that are keeping you busy? Yeah, so we have a finance big piece. Uh, a lot of these integrations are, are a big piece. Um, and so those are kind of our main areas of focus currently. Uh, we are developing some, shall we say, tools uh, for our broker-dealer clients, uh, kind of larger organizations that are in charge of many advisors, mm-hmm. kind of distributed. And so uh, regulatory compliance uh, tools like that uh, are also on our building, building list. Okay. So he's saying sort of a practice will sign up and then maybe that manager or managers have access to certain parts of the platform and use it different user levels and all that sort of stuff. Right, right. So on a micro scale uh, manager, you know, different access, things like that, but uh, more on a macro scale. Cool. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how it's set up over in Australia, um, but okay. in the States, you know, you'll have these big broker dealers where they'll have independent advisory firms on their platform, right. but the main company is responsible for compliance for the entire group. Yeah. Um, but you know, revenue and things like that are determined by these individual firms. And so, uh, the, the big central organization, you know, wants certain controls and uh, yes. certain tools for archival and things like that. And so, yep. working on those as well makes total sense. And obviously, that's a, a ticket to the the big end of town, which makes total sense as well. Um, yep. I mean, in terms of development as well, do you see like this is in its current form quite a reactionary tool? So the AI is essentially digesting um, or summarizing something that has happened. Yeah. Do you feel that given, I know we've talked about data storage or, or a lack thereof of data storage. Yeah. Do, do you think moving forward that instead of just maybe summarizing and being reactive to a conversation that eventually – tools like FinMate AI or others will actually lead the advisor down like a conversation path, maybe yes. based on previous conversations that have been captured with the client, so a tailored yeah. path? Yeah, good, good question. Um, we are considering things like that. So uh, this might bifurcate our user base, uh, meaning they'll have to choose um, the option for longer term storage sure, on FinMate. Sure. Uh, this might be a better fit for a lot of CRMs to integrate at AI onto their platforms, honestly. Uh, for us, obviously, suggestions are very important. And so that's why, as we are thinking about additional client deliverables, um, we're looking into uh, resources that the advisor can send to the clients uh, based on the conversation that they just had. Um, we're also taking a look at some potential like live suggestions, um, but I think don't think the transcription quality is quite there for live transcribing services. Right. And so uh, maybe in a few iterations and generations of AI evolving, I think um, useful live suggestions could work. I, I do have some friends uh, who work in uh, a tech company where they do uh, AI transcribing for uh, you know Chinese takeout restaurants. Okay. And so... Uh, for them, because it's a lot more deterministic, they're able to serve up suggestions on like what the order is. Right. Uh, but for something as complex as kind of financial planning, I yeah. don't think it's quite there yet. Uh, so in terms of that takeaway example, there's really only a limited amount of questions or scenarios that you might come across. So it's far easier to determine what is the next best response or suggested response. Right, right. So the client calls in um, and the AI is transcribing um, and they, you know, they're 
they're asking for a certain menu item that might not necessarily be on the item menu itself. And no, so their AI menu. can say, hey, maybe it's this. Right. Um, right. Nice. I mean, a sort of final question, Daniel, would be when or have you reached a point yet where you've gone, like, good, goodness gracious me, what have I done? Like it was a lot easier being a financial advisor or has it not reached that point yet? <laughs> uh, I think I think at that point came uh, day one. <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> I, I took a pretty massive pay cut um, going from financial advising uh, into tech. So uh, yeah. decided, uh, you know, hey, I want to explore the space. Um, I think, you know, given my uh, te- technical, more technical background, I could yep. bring uh, some useful yeah. tooling to the advisory space. But yeah, that first step was a huge cut down. And then obviously starting your own startup, that's uh, – that's another step down, and yeah. then investing in your own startup. That's an even further step down. So, yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, definitely have that thought uh, every yep. step of the way. Yeah, uh, but I think I think we're building something useful, and uh, oh, definitely, uh, you know, the advisor feedback has been pretty pretty great, and it just uh, it makes you feel like you're you're doing something yeah. uh, useful for for uh, your old folks. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I, I think that you've really opened my eyes to why those i sort of mentioned before why those generic tools are either so inconsistent or not focusing on the things you want to focus on so it's a it's definitely a niche but it's you're going really deep into that one problem which is a problem for every single at least financial planning practice and then you've gone even deeper to the different types of meetings that are being held and i think this has massive application and massive efficiency and productivity benefits for every person in the practice. Like if you think about as well an advisor that's going back to back to back to back in terms of meetings and maybe they have a regimented or rigid process of file noting that meeting after, all it takes is a couple of emails or an unexpected phone call in that little break for the wheels to fall off and, you know, you're doing file notes, you know, that night, that afternoon or even days after and you just it's just not how things should be done. And it yeah. also hinders the the poor power planner or the poor associate that needs to pick up that work and, and actually build the strategy or build the advice documents because yeah. they don't actually have all the data or all the information. I This, again, comes from personal experience. I've, I've had those back-to-back meeting days. And, uh, you know, number one, you know, after your fourth meeting, your, your brain's just fried yeah. because you have to be, you know, constantly on, on. and engage with the client. And yeah. so you've been, you know, Hyper focused, hyper engaged for four hours. Now you're just brains burnt out, and you know you look at your notes and it's chicken scratch. Yeah. Oh, this makes so much sense while you're in the meeting, yeah. and four hours later, exactly. What, what did we talk about? And then, and then you know, meetings start legible. blending together. Yeah. Like, okay, I need to document this into my CRM, yeah. but ah, it's just not coming out as detail. But I'm just too tired. Yeah. And then your paraplaner is like, this has no information in it. Then they have to go back to the client. It's like, hey, I know we talked about this, but like. Where was your four hundred one k again? Yeah. You know, where was this account again? You know, it's yeah. like, and you know, that just slows the entire process down. And so, exactly. Yeah, you know, this is just something that uh, I wish I had when I was an advisor. So I figure that's a pretty, pretty good way to think about the, you know, deciding what we want to build next is that, and what features to build next is that. What would I have liked while I was in the seat? <laughs> For sure. And yeah. yeah, people who have been in the chair always seem to build the best tools. So congratulations. And just the sort of final point is that, yeah, clients shouldn't be penalized for having a meeting later in the day in terms of, you know, 3, 4, 5 p.m., et cetera, versus those of the first one off the rank or the first came yeah. off the rank. Yeah. So, yeah, Daniel, thank you so much. And, yeah, where can people learn more and, and maybe sign up to Finmate AI? Yeah. Uh, our website is called finmate.ai. That's F-I-N-M-A-T-E dot A-I. Uh, Once you go to the website, uh, you can sign up for a free trial. Uh, You automatically get five hours of usage. If you need more, uh, feel free to reach out to me at daniel at denmate.ai. On our website as well, there is a uh, calendar scheduling available. If you want to book a consultation or just chat with me about AI, I'm available. Perfect. Daniel, thank you so much. Thank you.